Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. The Lord has not returned for us, and we're still here, so we're studying together in the Epistle to the Corinth, the first Epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we were in chapter 14, and we were in the subject of deep into the subject of tongues, and so we're going to continue on with that, Lord willing. Uh, for as long as he tarries. This whole entire month is really a high watch month as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not so sure if we can just kind of forget about that after September and go into spring, you know, just kind of postpone our thoughts about it all until spring. I think that with everything going on, we are probably at the highest point time of watch time ever uh, in our life, but that's just my opinion. Uh, in fact, so much has happened, folks, so much has happened that we've lost, we're beginning to lose track of all of the significant, I think, events and, and uh, the things that have happened that, that, that tend to confirm the time in which we're living. Uh, I think if you're just half awake, you know that the Lord, our Lord is coming soon. So until he does, we're going to be uh, doing, I think, what we should be doing, and that is occupying until he comes. Uh, the Word of God is uh, that's our strength, our comfort, our hope. Uh, we can't, uh, in my opinion, we can't do anything wrong by continuing on in our study of it, in growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope everyone out there is well and not burning up by the heat uh, you know it's still a uh, pretty hot here in Oklahoma we've had a really really hot summer uh, hay is scarce uh, my friends in Arkansas they can't get hay we can't hardly get hay not good hay you know because it just burned everything up and uh, uh, I don't think that has anything to do with anything prophetic uh, it's uh, it's it's sort of a custom here in Oklahoma to you know be hot one day and cold the next, but that is one of my concerns about you know where we're going, how I'm going to feed my horse, and uh, of course that brings up an interesting subject because we feed ourselves, folks, on this, and we feed one another, uh, we care for one another, we have the same love, care, and concern for one another. At least that ought to be our primary concern, is what we eat. And just as my horse has got to have hay, we have got to have this. So let's begin by with a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful that we belong to you, that you chose us, uh, redeemed us, and forgave us. We're thankful for the privilege, the wonderful privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to, to think about your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who opens it to us, uh, overruling the foolishness of the flesh and the problems of our thinking and our reasoning. Just open our hearts to the truth that you would have us know that Christ might be exalted and that the Father might be glorified in the Son. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I can't begin to tell you just how controversial this chapter is. In our last study together, we were in the area of verses 7 and 8 of chapter 14. And without any question, chapter 14 is the primary passage on tongue speaking, even though it's mentioned in various other uh, passages of the New Testament. And I have stressed in every one of these studies that this is God's Word. These are not Paul's thoughts. It's not Paul's reasoning. Not, it's not Paul's feelings that we're looking at. And these truths are not limited just to the believers at Corinth some 2,000 years ago. Uh, God's Word is timeless. It's not time-oriented. 
This is the word of the sovereign God, and it is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, and for instruction in righteousness. It is unbelievable how many times, even in, without realizing it, that we're led to believe that it really isn't God's word. You know, that this is Paul's thinking. It's, uh, well, yeah, it's Moses' writing or something else. You know, Moses did write the book of Genesis, but God authored it. This, folks, is one volume from Genesis to Revelation. The book of Genesis begins within the beginning, and the book of Exodus begins with and, and it goes on, and it goes on and on as one coherent revelation from the sovereign God. The problem of tongue speaking, uh, it, it became quite prevalent in early pagan times and then during the early Christian time at the beginning of the church, uh, like you know the time of the Corinthians here. And then it was revived again in the early 1900s all around the world. I have tried to make it as clear as I can that the word tongue is a word for language. It isn't the speaking of incoherent speech or, or ra the ramblings of, you know, of, of your mind, the, the, the you know, babbling, uh, uh, gibberish. It's not some kind of heavenly language that nobody knows. The word means language, folks. In the King James Version, you'll notice that many times the word unknown is, well, in, in fact, the word unknown is not there. It's italicized, but the word unknown is coupled with the word tongue, and that's because the inference is that this is a language that the person uh, speaking uh, it didn't previously know. And so in our present study, we're looking at languages being spoken by people who did not know these languages before. Now we can call that a miracle, we can say that's miraculous, uh, we can say that's a gift from God, but that's where we are. Uh, the 14th chapter, folks, is not, this. the 14th chapter is not an appeal for speaking in tongues. It isn't a defense of tongue speaking. It is, in fact, a vigorous appeal against it contrary to popular opinion. And I have to point that out. The thing that you ought to desire is proclamation. And I pointed out last week, there are those who say, uh, just in the 13th chapter, you know, you know, uh, we're told, well, we're told that the gift of prophesying is restric restricted to uh, telling the future. Most people think of prophecy in that sense. I don't believe that at all. There is a gift of being able to properly proclaim the Word of God. The word prophecy can be interpreted as proclaim, depending on the context. It's God who gave it, but you can desire the ability, even though He gave it, you can desire the ability, the opportunity, the privilege of proclaiming the truth of this book if you want to know whether you're doing that, chapter 14, verse 3, I believe made it very, very clear that if you are doing that, then you are building people up. You're edifying them. You're, you're giving them truth to build them up. You're encouraging them and you are comforting them. And they need encouragement. They need comfort. We all do. That's what you're doing. And much of modern speech, much of modern preaching at least, is dedicated to convicting you. If we can just get you properly convicted, you know, we can not only get you saved, quote unquote, I put that in quotes, but we can get your money and your time and your service. You know, I'm, I, it's pathetic to say that, but much of modern preaching is nothing more than trying to frighten, convict, 
or do something to get people to make a decision seems like an innocent thing just make a decision never mind the fact that you're adding to what Christ did he didn't do enough you've got to do something which some people consider to be very important unbelievable I, you can decide whether to be born or not uh, you know it's a ridiculous thought when you think about it if you are God's child folks you have always been that you you have always been God's child you were God's child from before the foundation of the world you were chosen in Christ before he ever created the heavens and the earth you've always been his child you were never a child of the devil you were always God's child that ought to comfort you that ought to encourage you and whenever I suggest that sometimes God's children don't believe you know when it, when I say well sometimes we as Christians God's people they don't believe God there's almost a, a an immediate negative reaction I, I don't know why every one of God's children believe him or come on I doubt that I think that probably the majority of Christians don't believe don't trust God now if you really believe him okay if you really believe him then you give thanks for you know the torn ligaments and the, the tendons and the, the bumps on the head and the, and everything else if you don't believe him that does not mean that you're not his child. All you parents out there, you've had children who's they didn't they didn't believe you. You see, we've been schooled or or whatever word you want to use to believe that those who who believe in those who trust God are going to heaven and those who don't believe him are going to hell when the biblical truth is that his children are going to heaven, his children are going to heaven, and Satan's children are going to hell, and there is no intermingling of these two families. If you're Satan's child, you've always been that. If you are God's child, you've always been that. And that is a, a horrible thought to many people. And I don't understand that. Why, you have the privilege to have a family and God doesn't? I, folks, isn't it wonderful that God has a family and that God cares for that family, loves that family? I think that's ab absolutely fabulous you know do you prefer to think that, that God is some impoverished deity who sits there just just sits up there he's hoping that you'll join his family and he's and who is crushed if you don't is that the kind of God that you want to worship isn't it marvelous that God has a family and he cares for it he, he loves you. He's always loved you. His love has never changed. He's working in, in you for your good. Oh, why, Lord, the suffering? Why, why, you know, why, why, why? The answer has to be because it's best for you, my child. I love you. I, don't, I do not believe, dearly beloved, I do not believe that God has ever dealt with any one of you except in love if you're his child so if we're really proclaiming the truth of the word of god prophesying in our chapter here and it's heard by his children it builds them up it encourages them it comforts them it doesn't breed fear in their lives or worry so if i'm proclaiming the truth of his word you're built up you're encouraged and you're comforted If God's Word is truly proclaimed, folks, you ought to go about your way with a skip in your step. I do not think that there's some sort of Damocles hanging over your head. 
You know, and if you don't accept Christ, that you're going to hell. I don't, I don't know how many have accepted Christ on false pretenses. I know many have. What we have to proclaim is God's Word without any question, without any question at all, the chapter makes it clear that people would prefer tongues over being built up, encouraged, and comforted any day of the week. The miraculous speaking of languages that were never understood before You know, if there's a pastor in the pulpit preaching the gospel who's there for the money or whatever else, maybe he's uh, lusting, you know, for something or one thing or the other, power, influence, whatever, and he doesn't really comprehend it, he doesn't really believe it, he's speaking a language he doesn't understand, but the believer, the elect, will understand it. How can he convey that relay that because he had, he speaks the language you know haven't we done many wonderful works in your name he, he didn't say no you haven't he said I never knew you and I think many a preacher headed for hell has reached the heart of God's people now, that's a, so, a sobering thought and and they've been enlightened they've been encouraged they've been comforted you know, it's, it's wonderful how my God works. Because that's what this book does, folks. That's what the Word does. Preacher doesn't do that. Teacher doesn't do that. I cannot do anything for you, folks. I can't. It's God who works in you both the will and to do of His good pleasure. So we're contrasting speaking in a language that we never knew versus proclaiming the truth of God's Word. You see these contrasts as you go through these, chap these several past chapters, especially chapter 14 here. The contrast between childhood and maturity, and, and it goes consistently through the rest of the, of the 14th chapter. So that's the contrast that is consistent in this chapter. We are contrasting when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and when I... When I grew up and was mature, I put away childish things. Now clearly the inference was that tongue speaking, and by that I mean a, a language, an actual language, was childish. We got to the sixth verse. If I come speaking in a language, what profit is it for you? If there isn't any revelation, knowledge, proclaiming, or doctrine, and the answer has to be none. So I, I come here before you folks here, I and I speak in a in an unknown language for thirty minutes, and and no prophet, no revelation, no knowledge, no proclamation, no doctrine. What a waste of time. Clearly, the contrast is without interpretation, it's worthless. It goes on, and, and it says, if we have an instrument that isn't blown with distinction, then who knows what's played or heart? Just a waste of time. Imagine, folks, imagine me sitting here playing nothing for 30 minutes. You know, but it, it could be more serious than that. And that's where we ended last video, last time. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to battle? That is a serious thought, okay? Uh, those of you who have been in the military, you totally understand what I'm saying. If the word's not properly proclaimed, maybe we move in the wrong direction. If we, if we meant charge and we, we trumpeted retreat, well, you know, people are going to retreat. 
clearly the eighth verse says that when we proclaim the Word of God, we ought to be careful about it. It ought to be a certain sound. I know you, some of you folks will understand this. what I'm saying. The word of this book, is it's music to your ears. You recognize that. I recognize that the ministry I've had here and the teaching I've done has been severely criticized because of my emphasis on the absolute supreme sovereignty of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God, a very God incarnate. The, the scriptures could not be any clearer that God the Son came to do the will of the Father. He was and He is God in the flesh. You know, and, and the in, interesting thing about that is that is that flesh rose from the dead. So God in flesh is in heaven today at the right hand of God in spirit. He's our God. And now He says He's the way, the truth, and the life, and we are to proclaim that truth. We preach Christ. Nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Why do you not understand my speech? Our Lord said. Well, because you are not mine. My sheep, my sheep, hear my tongue. Okay, I'm sorry. I, it, my sheep hear my voice. Think, think language here, okay? And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never perish. And 10,000 Arminian pastors, churches, you know, they'll be preaching this Sunday. That, that you who are headed for heaven could perish. Folks, I was raised in both. I was raised in a Baptist and then a Pentecostal church. I was raised in a church for a while where you could go to heaven on Monday, you could go to hell on Tuesday, you could go to heaven on Wednesday, hell on Thursday. You know, well, if that's true, then who decides on which day I die? If I'm God's child, well, I'm sure, then I'm, I'm sure going to die on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. If I'm Satan's child, I'm going to die on what? Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Is, folks, is, is Christ lying they sh when He said, they shall never perish? Is that true? I'll tell you that the great majority of professing Christians today are, are Arminian in their conviction. Some of the great teachers at seminaries are very Arminian. You've got to be careful. You know, you can lose your salvation. You can, what they mean is redemption. You can lose your redemption. Well, if that's true, folks, if that's true, Jesus Christ lied. This is why I said to you, no man can come unto me except my Father draws him, and all that my Father has given me, I shall lose none. Is he lying? And folks, that ought to be encouraging. That's, pro, that's the proclamation that we should be proclaiming. That ought to be encouraging to you. If you're God's child, you are absolutely secure. That ought to build you up. That ought to encourage you. That ought to comfort you. Oh, but Steve, you just don't know how I live. Don't want to know. You know, uh, we're not, as they say, sinners saved by grace. I, I'm gonna, I'll tell you that right now. We're not that. God never calls you a sinner. He does say you're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. God redeemed you. And God doesn't call you that. Where does He call you a sinner? Well, He doesn't. He calls you a son. He calls you His child. He tells you that He loves you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Oh, dearly beloved, study this book. The Word of God builds you up. It comforts you. Its proclamation is so great. Do, do not proclaim an uncertain sound. I can't imagine how many Christians have been 
you know, just driven into total despondency, total despair, because the trumpet sounded an uncertain sound. I recognized in, in, in the context that we're, we're, we are contrasting here, in this context, we're contrasting direct proclamation of God's Word versus tongues. I know that. But I'm also encouraging you to think about a, a correct proclamation. An accurate proclamation, cro proclamation. You know, somebody came to me almost hysterical, crying one time, and, you know, and saying, I don't know what to do. I, I said, well, what's the problem? And he, he said, well, our pastor said that if the Lord is not Lord of all in my life, then he's not Lord at all. And I said, well, did he give you a reference? I mean, that may sound good, but it's just flat out wrong. It's not, that's not biblical. I said, what does he tell you to do? He said, he said well, he, he tells me to, to make the Lord the Lord of my life. Make him, make him Lord, okay? I said, I told the guy, I said, I, we don't have the right or the ability to make God anything. He's the Lord of your life. He's either the Lord of your life or he's not, folks. He is the Lord of your life if you're his child. You don't make him that. You don't make him anything. You don't make him that. If he's not Lord of your life, he's not Lord at all. It's not biblical. Jesus Christ is not only God, a very God, but he's the Lord of your life. He's the Lord of your life, whether you recognize that or not. Let's don't hear an uncertain sound. Let's proclaim truth. And in this particular chapter, it is contrasted with speaking in a language that people don't understand. Okay? And so the ninth verse begins, So in the same way, you, unless you utter by your tongue words easy to be understood. Easy to be understood. You know, folks, I'm, I'm, I have some training as, as a Bible teacher. So I'll tell you, there's a great, great desire to stand up theologically and use words like, you know, uh, superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism and all these different terms, theological terms that, that people don't generally understand, but at least, well, at least that'll show how smart I am, right? I mean, you know, so I've tried my best to limit that. I think sometimes when pastors use some of those words, I, I you know, I, well, I just almost like to raise my hand and say, uh, you know, would you define that? You know, because maybe these people here, they don't know what you're talking about. I do know the word's easy to be understood. I know what that means. That's this book. That's God's word. The creator of heaven and earth, he spoke in words easy to be understood, folks. Is it easy to be understood? Why do you not believe me? Well, because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Think language, okay? I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. None of, none of those are very complicated words, folks. Word, love is a one-syllable word, not, not complicated. You know, they don't sound like superlapsarianism and all that stuff, you know. They're simple words. Unless you utter words easy to be understood, which is Im impossible if you're speaking in a language that nobody understands, how shall it be known what you speak? So, you're speaking in the air. You spent the whole sermon just talking in the air. It's all worthless. I think that's pathetic. We don't want that. There are, verse 10, many kinds of languages in the world. There are many kinds of languages, and none of them, not one of them, exists without the ability to convey meaning. That's, that's what it says. All of these languages, all of them, have the ability to convey meaning. 
you know, so I can go to France. I don't know why I'd want to, but and and have no idea what they're saying. You know, there are many, many languages in the world. Why 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 would the book why would the book say that? Why would the book say that? Because God put them there. I mean, what think back, what happened at the Tower of Babel? Now he confused the languages. You know, can you imagine what it must? <coughs> can you imagine what it must have been like? I mean, seriously, all these guys getting together to build this big tower, you know, and, and then they couldn't understand each other. You know, it's like the, you know, oh, what happened to you? Uh, you drunk? Uh, you know, it must have really been something. You know, I'd almost like to write a book on it. You know, the bricklayer. He, he couldn't any longer uh, communicate with the carpenter. Must have been a mess. Lots of these languages are there because God put them there. God put them there. And he had a reason for doing that because he was going to tell his people that with those, with, with those of other languages, he would speak to them. And we see that in Isaiah pretty soon. Uh, uh, well, I've, I've thought about going, actually going through a study of Isaiah. I don't think we're going to be here that long. But, folks, these tongues, they're not meaningless babble, okay? And the modern tongues movement doesn't, it doesn't convey meaning to anybody. So these languages do convey meaning. So therefore, if I don't know the, the meaning that it conveys by that language, verse 11, then I'm to the one that's speaking a barbarian. And likewise, he that, that speaks is a barbarian to me. That's, that is why an, an atheist and I you know, we just speak diff a different language. We don't even, we can't understand each other. We don't speak the same language. He speaks a, a language that I don't understand, and I speak a language that he doesn't understand. I speak a language I know he doesn't understand. So we can't communicate. That's what it says. If I don't know the meaning of this language... Well, then we're just to each other a waste of time. We're not going to convey any meaning. What is the reason to speak if we're not conveying meaning? I mean, why speak? Yeah, I can make a lot of jokes about that when it comes to married you know, life and stuff like that. But, you know, I'll try to refrain here from doing that. What sense does it make to go around rattling something in a language that you didn't know before? You know, so, so that you could show to people, you know, look, I have the gift. You know, I can speak in this language. Nobody understands. I'm, you know, I, nobody understands what you're saying. Like, what profit is in that? Well, other than maybe, you know, some glory for you. Surely, none for God. Doesn't convey any meaning. Doesn't help. We are soon going to be told... The ultimate conclusion is that tongues are a sign. That's what they are. You see it in verse 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. Okay? And yet these are, and yet these are believers at Corinth who want to speak in tongues. Uh, there are people today who profess to know the Lord. Uh, they want to speak in tongues. But that's not what tongues are. They're a sign. Not for believers, but for unbelievers. So we are to be zealous, zealous, passionately uh, desire that for that which is spiritual, that which is mature. We have a present imperative. It's a command. Zealously seek 
that you may excel to the building up of the church. The only reason that you ought to speak in the church at all is to build it up. And if you speak in a language that nobody knows, that is, no interpreter around, you can't possibly build up the church. You're just, you're just barbarians to each other. There's no profit. You're speaking to the air. So up till now, in the chapter, we need an interpreter. At least if, if we're going to have any speaking any speaking in a language that, that wasn't known before. You know, the inference has been so far that I'm speaking in an unknown language, a language I didn't know before, and there's nobody there, nobody around to interpret what I said. And, and it's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort. It's speaking to the air. Therefore, verse 13, and that's, that's where we're going to stop for now. Let him that speaks in a language, and again, my Bible says unknown tongue. The, the word unknown is not there. You'll never see the word unknown. It'll always be italicized. A language he didn't know before. Pray earnestly that he may translate or interpret, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, wind up before we end the chapter. That if he can't interpret or translate, he shouldn't even speak. Dearly beloved, the modern pulpit today, in the age in which we're living, which is a very interesting time to be alive, okay, which convicts the child of God to be born again. I'm, you know speaks to me in a tongue, in a language, that I don't understand. Therefore, he's not speaking to me, but to God. But the one prophesying, the one proclaiming the truth of God's Word, speaks to me in a language that I do understand. And that, to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Look, I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.